Okay, I'm going to uh, have some brief comments on Amitabh's presentation. Uh, limit them to three points. The first concerns ACA and uh, ACA reforms and the spending growth. So, if you look at the past, we have had many experiences with payment reforms. The first one in the 80s came in with DRGs, where we had bundled payment for diagnosis within providers as opposed to across providers. The second one was the revolution of integration of payers and providers through HMOs, which got a little uh, overwhelmed and got kicked back to PPOs. But basically a revolution where we went from about 10% of coverage being covered by such uh, integrated plans up to 90% plus within a very, very short time period, an enormous revolution. Uh, even though the bad rhetoric exists, the behavior sort of indicates that that's probably one of the most uh, salient success stories in healthcare delivery. The third revolution that took place was patient-centered care of high-cost individuals. We call it disease management. The problem with all these experiences is that through this period, we had rapid spending growth. So even though we've been through this before, and I'm sure at the time, if you look at the, what people said would happen, it uh, would be that these payment reform would dramatically slow down spending growth. It didn't occur. So now we're basically faced with the question, the new version, the new spin is bundled payments and ACOs, which is sort of bundled payments not within providers, but across providers and type of care. So the question is, is this time different uh, than the 80s, 90s, and 2000s? Uh, and uh, if this was the first time we were told that payment reform is going to slow spending growth, one would be more optimistic. But given that this is a long-time tradition, I wouldn't really want to bet my house on that this is going to uh, do much. The problem with spending growth, as Amitabh alluded to, and many people here are aware of, is that it's driven by medical innovation. And these reforms are not designed to deal with medical innovation. And <laughs> medical innovation is driven mainly by global innovation incentives. So we see a new surge in diabetes and leads to a very predictable explosion, which Ann Peterson had a great graph of in the 90s, explosion of new innovations as the prevalence of this condition grew in a sort of very predictable fashion, the growth of the market across the world led to more innovation into that condition. <clears throat> if that's the case, that medical innovation is driving spending growth and medical innovation is determined by global markets, meaning how much US, China, India, and Russia, and Brazil are going to demand these products, then it's hard to believe that a Massachusetts experience has little we, we can't learn much from Massachusetts, put it that way, because the key driver of spending growth is not being altered in some sense. So local experiences, local markets don't presumably uh, drive global innovation incentives. We were involved with uh, precision health economics with advising NICE, and I was very unpopular when I said you can shut down the UK and it's not going to do much to innovation because you're 3% of world spending. So don't think about how you, what you do here impact innovation unless it is influencing emerging markets, which is partly the reason why it might come in. I think it's the same with, with Massachusetts. So what do we learn from payment reforms in Massachusetts for spending growth is limited because we haven't changed global returns from innovation. Value-based insurance design, second comment. So economists have studied value-based insurance design since the 70s under different lingo. Polly and Seckhauser, I think, are the sort of the main people that people point to in starting to analyze how copay structures should be designed to the greatest value of the insurance holder. 
and the classic issue in that context was that you're trading off essentially, and this is important, I think, as a, how it relates to diabetes, you're trading off essentially imposing more risk on people. If you have co-pays, obviously, if you're sick and you have great co-pays, you don't have a lot of insurance to talk about. On the other hand, obviously, if you're fully insured, you might induce, that, that coverage might induce you to demand care that you otherwise wouldn't induce. And that's the classic, what economists call a moral hazard problem. <clears throat> so there's a trade-off because we don't want to have premiums covering excessive care that shouldn't be given through that uh, inducement. And therefore, we get all kinds of attempts to reduce care at the time of service, not because we like to penalize patients or get doctors upset, but because we want to hold down premiums. <coughs> so that literature essentially says you should have a value-based insurance design in that context tells you that you should have essentially low co-pays for things that you're not inducing people to, to do if you, if you lower those co-pays. So if you look at, for example, inpatient care in, in hospitals, that's much more insured by people with lower co-pays than other types of care such as dental care and mental health care where the insurance coverage itself induces people into demanding more care. So if you have an inefficiently designed copay structure in that world, then lowering copays should not affect behavior. That is to say, lowering copays should not increase adherence, for example. That would be bad news in that world because you basically, lowering copays is better insurance. You don't want to induce excessive care from doing so. <coughs> now, the great author, Dana Goldman, and his less and his research assistant, Thomas Philipson, came up with sort of how to treat this in a, in a more comprehensive setting so that you don't get the result that, you know, increase or lowering co-pays should not increase adherence. That means I have 40 more minutes? Okay. So, <coughs> in that setting, basically what was key is that uh, the copay structure should be designed is under multiple scenarios. We took drug coverage being a, a primary example of what we analyzed of essentially lowering drug coverage is affecting other types of services. And in that scenario, essentially reducing copays, if you're doing things correctly, should increase usage or let's say drive adherence. <coughs> I think when it comes to diabetes, it's important, I think, to look at what we, def when we talk about value-based insurance design, sometimes value seems very poorly defined. Sometimes it's defined as things we should lower co-pays for, in some sense, which is a little circular. So what, is, what do we mean by value when we talk about value-based insurance design? And that's less clear many times in those, those discussions. <coughs> this is particularly true, I think, in diabetes where there's several things that kind of make it different. So if you look at future directions in diabetes research and talking about optimal value-based insurance design, I think there's several opportunities. One is that we don't think there's overconsumption of these drugs. A lot of the issues is not moral hazard, it's under usage of these drugs that we're trying to deal with. The second issue is that it's chronic disease, so there's not a lot of risk in these situations that many times, unless you're newly diagnosed, but if you're previously diagnosed and you continue on on your health plan, we're not trying to trade off some kind of risk uh, with the, the incentives for overconsumption, which is the traditional discussion. More importantly, the last thing is that a lot of times insurance design is coupled up with altruism. So health economists wrongly believe that, you know, low co-pays lead to moral hazard, which has the implication that Medicaid should raise co-pays, but that's crazy because med the reason we have low co-pays in Medicaid is because we'll we basically have altruistic motives that want to stimulate consumption of people. So when the rich want to take care of the poor, there's an additional reason for a subsidy uh, beyond the co-pay subsidy in, in insurance. So I think those three factors, the, the different nature of risk in a chronic disease, uh, the <coughs> The overconsumption not being an issue in, in diabetes, in terms of at least in drug coverage, 
and the fact that altruism needs to be covered by appropriate insurance coverage makes the design or sort of the explicit analysis of value-based insurance design in this context different, but also there's a lot of opportunities for improvement.